and welcome to our webinar. First of all, before I welcome you all, I just want to apologize. There was a little bit of a technical delay, uh, an issue with our Zoom link. Um, so if you had some friends joining, you can just let them know that the new Zoom link is in everybody's email. And again, we apologize for any inconvenience. Um, but hopefully, uh, if you can join us, this will not uh, take away from the kind of main part of our webinar here. We're hoping to uncover the transformative power of AI in the entrepreneurial journey. Um, I'm your host, Julia Reinhardt, and together with our guests today, we're going to dive deep into the discussions that blend technology, innovation, and diverse entrepreneurial stories from our panel of immigrant experts. Um, and before we move on, I just want to mention as well that today's conversation is a collaborative effort under the Curate Project which is co-funded by Erasmus Plus and led by Hagahelia University of Applied Sciences as a Ulysses Satellite Project in collaboration with Université Côte d'Azur, Technical University of Košice, MCI, the Entrepreneurial School, and the University of Münster. Curate will spearhead the development of an incubator program in collaboration with the Applied AI for Business and Education Innovation Hub. The Curate project combines expertise in AI and entrepreneurship. So unsurprisingly, uh, the topic of today is the intersection of AI and entrepreneurship and how this synergy is crafting new pathways for immigrant innovators. Um, and we're privileged to have our panel of international guests and they each bring a wealth of experience and unique perspectives to the table. I'm gonna come over here and join you guys. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and meet our panelists. Uh, we're gonna go start over here with Evelyn Bacot, and she is a beacon of innovation and entrepreneurial spirit, and she is currently revolutionary, revolutionizing the corporate catering industry with food. Yeah, did I say it right? Yes, you said Yes, it. okay, I've been really practicing. <laughs> hurry, hurry. Um, and she has a background also working uh, in Huawei, uh, in the R&D center, and an instrumental role in nurturing Finland's startup ecosystem. Um, we used to work together, so I know Evelyn has a long background in this, also working with students. Um, she's very experienced, also in empowering student ventures, leading business development initiatives, um, um, and I think this really showcases her commitment to fostering growth and creativity in the entrepreneurial landscape. So let's all welcome Evelyn Bacot to the panel. And we're gonna kind of move over here to the other side where we have Tamara Varenich, and she brings a rich background uh, in communications and public speaking. <laughs> I'm glad someone has a background in it. That's great because I'm still working on it. Maybe you guys are too. Um, but she is the former head of communications for Access Helsinki, which is our entrepreneurship society for students here at Hagahelia. And she's currently a brand new communications specialist at Kone. Yeah. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. And in Kone, she is at the heart of transformative projects, shaping the future of one of Finland's largest companies. Yeah. Are, are they the third, third largest company? Third largest company. Okay, I remember Finland. that correctly. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and she has expertise in advertising, PR, and international business, as well as a passion for engaging audiences. And I think that this is going to make her a dynamic force on our panel and in any conversation about innovation and growth. And now we move on to our real amazing AI expert who has joined us here in the flesh, Umar Ali Khan. And he is a distinguished feature uh, figure in artificial intelligence. And he is currently enriching the field, thankfully here, at Hagahelia as a senior researcher. He has a background in academia. He's had research roles in Austria, Germany, Pakistan, now Finland as well. Uh, why did you come here? The weather's terrible, it's snowing today. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to leave us? <laughs> Um, it's better than 50 degrees Celsius. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Um, but Umer specializes in advancing AI through research and machine learning, so he's going to tell us about that today, as well as computer vision, ethical AI systems. He's very deeply involved in a project called the Finnish AI Region, or FAIR, as a project uh, AI consultant, and he wants to enhance not only AI understanding and adoption across Finland, but to also ensure the development of responsible and impactful AI solutions. So welcome everybody um, to the panel. And we are going to discuss together the intricacies, I think, of the AI on entrepreneurship and hopefully get some insights from you guys. You have very diverse backgrounds, um, different experiences. So hopefully we can come to some kind of common understanding and gain some insights today together 
um, for the audience. But first of all, I have a question for Evelyn. Um, and Evelyn, from your vantage point, you work in corporate catering, right, with your company, Fugge. How is AI creating new opportunities, do you think, <clears throat> especially for immigrant entrepreneurs like yourself? Yeah, I was thinking of, of this a lot from my own experience of Fuge and how we built Fuge. So when we started in 2021, I think that that time this big AI boom didn't really happen yet. So everything that we figured out about business, we just kind of learned it by ourselves, And, you know, we Google searched everything, basically, how to set up a business, where can you get support? So we researched a lot on Google and um, Everything that we did uh, from our marketing activities through delivery, through operations, everything was very manual. So, of course, it was really like tedious and really hard work. And now when I think of what we have right now at this mo point, I just realized that basically AI and all sorts of automation is part of our everyday life. So I think it really gives us a lot of kind of leverage in the industry. Because I think our industry is not really the one that is famous for, you know, digitalization or this kind of digital solutions. Um, but also it's, it's really kind of helped us to improve our kind of efficiency, improve our operations, improve my marketing uh, activities. So if I were to start the business maybe today, I think it would be a lot of kind of time saving with the help mm. of AI. So kind of like in the research stage already, it would help me a lot. And I think also with, you know, marketing, I remember when uh, when we started Fuge and, you know, our first, our very first mar marketing activity was going to the kind of like the richest neighborhoods in Helsinki and just putting flyers to the people's homes about Fuge. And we had to research, you know, what, what are those neighborhoods where we can go and, you know, where our ideal clients are. And then today is just like, I, I just asked Chad GPT, hey, can you give me a list of, uh, of companies that are looking for this kind of solution? And then it just collects me those companies and it's super easy. I can just contact people in those companies through LinkedIn or whatever. So it's a lot easier. It doesn't require so much, you know, time to spend on research. And also for immigrant entrepreneurs specifically, I think AI is really helpful when it comes to language barriers. So information that might not be available um, for immigrants when they don't have the language skills, I think AIs can be really useful and kind of just tell you all the information that you need in your language. So I think, uh, yeah, it's a uh, time saving, more efficiency, and, you know, just be open for AI and then you can find these tools that can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You kind of mentioned about this aspect, especially for immigrant uh, entrepreneurs. It sounds like something that would really enhance the ability to communicate and communications. And of course, we know that this is something that's crucial. Um, but I may be wondering, Tamara, you're an expert in communications. Um, are there other ways that you think AI can kind of revolutionize or work with immigrants um, in business on their journey? Uh, for sure. I think um, AI can work not only with immigrants, but, you know, everyone at the moment in communications. And uh, when I was doing an interview, a job interview at Kona, I said this uh, very cliche phrase now that uh, AI is not going to steal your job, but people that can use it will. So. Mm -hmm. It, it's true. Um, using AI is very important, not only for the immigrants, of course, and uh, since uh, I am an immigrant myself and I very much relate to what Evelyn has just said in terms of research and, uh, you know, curating communication materials, translating, uh, for sure it can uh, help, but it can also be beneficial no matter uh, whether you are an immigrant or not. Um, for example, in communications, you can create um, videos completely generated by AI. Uh, I was just talking to Evelyn about how, for example, uh, I use it in my everyday work. Uh, when I make a video, for example, I can easily uh, ask AI to make subtitles for the video. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, very, very helpful. It saves me a ton of time. And uh, even when I have um, 
people, you know, because I work in an international company, so for, sometimes we have people from all around the world, and um, AI is really good at picking up the phrases that the person has said, no matter what their background is or what their kind of uh, uh, accent, for instance, is. So uh, I don't have to spend, uh, you know, time, you know, trying to uh, understand and uh, typing everything manually. So mm -hmm. uh, for sure, in, in that sense, uh, especially to do everything to do with language and speech, uh, it's AI is already here, so using these tools are extremely helpful. And in the future, I think they will only advance and um, become a more accessible. Awesome. So this is very like I think what you're mentioning is quite like applied usage of AI. But we have Umar here; he's a researcher. So I'm just wondering, from um, a research angle, what AI trends, developments, technologies do you think immigrant entrepreneurs or any entrepreneur should be aware of? Well, um, the most trending AI field these days is undoubtedly generative AI, mm -hmm. especially large language models, um, the AI models that can understand human language, images, and can generate human-like output. So uh, it's very important for entrepreneurs to learn how large language models work, mm -hmm. how they understand human language, how they produce natural language uh, output, images, videos, and other modalities. Uh, and the most important skills these days is prompt engineering. That is the skills of crafting input to large language models, like ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. At first, it seems very simple, but in fact, it's an art. And uh, it is not only important for um, the personal development, but also uh, to find solution to various problems and to find business opportunities as well. So it's important to learn how the context of large language model works and how useful it can be. The context re refers to additional input that we provide to large language models. It can be an additional data, some instructions or a role, a behavior that we want from large language models. So that really sets the tone of uh, large language models output. So it is very important for entrepreneurs to learn how large language models work and to master the art of prompt engineering. Could you give some specific tips about the prompt engineering? Because that sounds really interesting. Well, to be honest, there is no uh, simple way to learn. I mean, there is no uh, formula to learn prompt engineering, okay. but it's all about practice. Uh, because this is something uh, very recent. There are guidelines present, uh, which can be followed. And uh, the recent trends that we see in generative AI is integrating external data to large language models. Mm -hmm. That data could be any data, like a company's document, policy, legal document, healthcare-related document, anything. Mm -hmm. So if you integrate that data into large language models, you can produce more tailored output. Okay. And there are numerous applications for this. For example, AI co-pilot, AI assistants, customized conversational agents, for example, for resolving customer queries automatically, for providing product-related information, for example, for taking input from patients, summarizing it for the doctor, for further prescription, and then recommendation systems and uh, matchmaking platforms. That th Those are other applications of this. Uh, data integration with large language models. For example, suggesting um, houses based on uh, a customer's query, uh, suggesting uh, the right doctor based on a customer's uh, disease history, or maybe suggesting a legal expert or a scientific expert to uh, evaluate a scientific document. So there are numerous applications mm. of integrating external data into large language models. but. The first uh, thing is prompt engineering. This is something that the entrepreneurs should start from. And then they can go for the advanced solutions. And they can think about how the prompt engineering can be used for finding 
business opportunities. Because we have seen that people are using uh, simple prompt uh, engineering techniques to develop some simple applications. And they are making good money out of it. So that, that's the first entry point. So prompt engineering basically tells you how to unlock the potential of large language models. That's super interesting. I had a friend too, he said now, um, he's an entrepreneur, he said you can build, you know, basically your own AI knowing a little bit about Python, but it's kind of like a black box. Even if you don't know how it works, it's more like an engineering mindset versus kind of like a actually understanding machine learning mindset. And he was wondering about the implications of that, but I think that's maybe another discussion. Well, uh, yeah, so in the beginning, you don't need to worry about how large language models actually working. You don't need to understand its mechanism. You just need to understand how you can leverage it for mm -hmm. various tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. I'm obsessed with this stuff, so I'm thinking about it all the time, like, how can I train my own GPT? So I could go on, but maybe uh, we should talk about yeah, it later. <laughs> one day, one day you can do that, too. Yeah, yeah, but, we, we will talk yeah. about this later, though, because I need to move on, but I, I'm, like, super fascinated by this. This is my own special interest, so maybe not for this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a little bit, Evelyn, about how the AI tools have kind of impacted your business, like your strategy. But can you remember one point besides the ones you mentioned where, you know, it was like a really pivotal moment and somehow the AI was really useful to you? Yeah, I think um, I think it was the moment when we started integrating all sorts of automations into our operations. It might be not so visible from the outside, but it really kind of helped us streamline everything that we were doing manually. So for example, when we started Fuge, everything was, you know, an order came in and then we got the, like the, I don't know, cocktail bites or breakfast items that we had to prepare. And then the next step was, all right, so we sit down or someone sits down and, you know, writes down all the ingredients that we need to buy in order to prepare those things. And then that person goes, orders them, and then we start preparing. And then we are left maybe with a tons of waste because we didn't really estimate it correctly. And then the next person takes the order, finds it on the delivery route, and then, you know, it was just all manual. And then we started uh, using uh, automation systems. So now how it works is that basically our system just calculates everything. Uh, so when we have the weekly orders in, the system just tells us that this is how many kilograms of uh, lettuce you need to order, this is how many kilograms of this. So it's super automated and super simple for us now. And it also sends to the kitchen like how to prepare it. So we, of course, we um, kind of trained it in a way that we put our own input into the system and now it knows that how it how to prepare those things so it's it's super easy now and also with our deliveries for example uh, when we have 26 deliveries in one day it's quite hard to actually plan the route which is the most effective in both like time and you know fuel uh, perspective but now we use for example this kind of delivery route optimization system so it tells us that what route to take in order to save gas or in order to deliver it the fastest and it's super useful of course we save a lot of uh, a lot of time and also a lot of um, like it's it's more sustainable also because we are taking the shortest route possible. So I think it was this it wasn't really a moment, but it was more like a gradual shift to more automated system and more kind of digital uh, digital operations or, you know, integrating technology into operations. So I think it was really, really useful. And we're constantly doing that. For example, what uh, Omar mentioned, this kind of um, uh, recommendations. So we're now trying to develop a system where our clients can just go and they can put in their uh, person budget of what do they want and then our system just gives them the best recommendation of different types of foods. And it's really helpful for our clients because they often contact us that, hey, I have a cocktail event with 100 people and I don't really have a big budget, so what do you recommend? And then of course our team has to kind of brainstorm, we have to kind of come together and see what can we do? So we are now trying to teach our system to do that. And then it's more kind of automated and the client can get it instantly. So they don't have to wait for our reply. So I think there is a lot of things we are kind of now also trying to improve, but, but I think these kind of automated systems really helped us on the way. 
Mm, it sounds super helpful. And I'm kind of wondering as a piggyback question on that one, because I feel like corporate catering is not an industry that maybe is adopting this super fast. Maybe I'm wrong. Would you have any advice for people working in similar businesses, similar industries that are not so fast to adopt these AI tools? What would you tell them? Yeah, definitely. I think... Um... I think the, our industry is very good, uh, like the hospitality, restaurant and catering. We are very good at giving this kind of in-person experiences. I think that's what we are famous for. But then we, as I mentioned, we don't really have good uh, digital experiences for customers. I mean, many of the catering companies here in Helsinki, they don't even have a website or they don't have like, for example, uh, a product display on their website. And it's really difficult for the client to even know what are they what are they getting or what can they get? So I think I think just kind of like uh, integrating technology to the business is already a big advantage in the industry because not, not many companies are doing that. Even companies who, who have been existing for 100 years, they don't have website or they don't have this kind of digital customer experience platform. So I think just kind of like being open to these digital tools and technologies is already a big advantage. And, you know, not not kind of closing off that, oh, I'm, an, I'm in an industry which doesn't really integrate these, maybe I shouldn't either. I think it can really give an advantage. So you should just, you know, have an open mind, no matter if you're maybe working in a very manual industry or very kind of in-person industry. Thank you. That's super interesting. I hope that the people listening, you know, if you have a company like this, that you also give it a try because it's super interesting to hear how it's actually been working yeah. because I've been seeing the company from the beginning until now and all these kind of like improvements in the digitalization that you've been making. And it's been really interesting to watch. Um, but maybe some questions for Tamara. Um, you talked a little bit about this kind of multicultural environment and multicultural communication. So I'm just wondering, like, what kind of AI innovations have you been using? Maybe more specifically, you mentioned a couple there um, that work in multicultural um, landscapes, like the one you work in. Uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, I think uh, AI is generally here to help us with uh, anything to do with multicultural communication. Um, it can be translation, it can be simplifying the language, this one I use a lot. Um, it can be uh, even like, um, of course, I don't know, um, adjusting the message to your target audience, uh, depending on the location, on the, you know, uh, on what the person does so that the language uh, is easy to understand. Uh, so, yeah, these are these are primarily, you know, language related uh, kind of uh, features that you can use. Um, of course, subtitles. Yes, that's a that's one that I've already mentioned. Um, and yeah, I think basically you if again, like Omar said, if you know how to like the, the most important thing about AI, I think, is how you like to adjust it to to cater your needs, basically. Mm. So that, that's that's my thought. So anything can be uh, like anything AI related can be adjusted to that. Yeah. And how has AI kind of then adjusted your approach maybe to like branding, brand storytelling, other tasks you have like around communications and marketing? Yeah, um, basically in, in my career, I haven't been using AI for so long. Uh, I was one of those people that only found out about AI when ChatGPT uh, came out. And uh, my husband works in software engineering. So he was the first person to tell me about ChatGPT. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. You can do anything with it. Um, one thing that I actually didn't uh, manage to do is I didn't manage to uh, to kind of to prompt ChatGPT well enough to make a song. Once I needed to make a song for me and it was awful. <laughs> and I tried many, many times and it just did not work. Uh, but anyway, so uh, what I think is really important here is that uh, you use the tools that you have available. Uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, the, the paid versions. It can be also free or features integrated into different systems like uh, Canva that I have used a lot uh, in um, CapCut. It's like an... an um, application for making videos. I've used uh, many AI features that they have available for free there. So that has been also very, very useful. In uh, Adobe also, uh, there are features that I use. And um, uh, Copilot, that's what we use at Kone. So 
these tools are there available and maybe you don't, you're not even aware of them or maybe you don't know how to use them but these are here for you to cater your needs and also actually my dream is also like you mentioned my dream is to ask somebody from our IT floor because I work for the IT transformation project at Kona so someone uh, on the IT floor to build a customized um, like I don't know chatbot or AI uh, thing <laughs> uh, anything they can do basically to to make it so uh, I can just write like write a post about blah 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 and then it would automatically make it in the tone of voice and everything in the language that would be understandable for my target audience so that is something that still I have to do manually I need to understand I need to always ask like okay who is your target audience for that message if I work with for example the business leaders um, and for example they say it is uh, everybody on the in IT so the language that I use needs to cater uh, IT as an audience so it doesn't have to be oversimplified it can be also a little bit technical and it has to be mm -hmm. uh, in some cases technical or if we are talking about uh, stakeholders in this case I need to understand who these stakeholders are and then I need to adjust the language for them so if there could be uh, an application that could do this job for me that would be amazing but it may replace me <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I hope I'll find something else to work on <laughs> that sounds like um, maybe some sort of AI based startup even could, could be so I have a question now for, for Umar who is who's our AI expert here and you have some AI consultancy experience uh, in Fair Eddy and I want to understand what advice would you offer to entrepreneurs um, who are looking to launch their very own AI based startup okay so First thing is that um, while you are launching a startup, you need to think whether you really need AI. Because in some cases, you don't need, need AI. Um, so you can solve some problems using some simple data-driven approaches or some traditional methods. This is one thing. And the next thing is uh, you need to understand the market of the country you are going to launch a startup in. For example, Finnish market has different requirements, different data privacy laws, different ethical issues. So you need to understand uh, what market you want to target. For example, if you are going to launch uh, a healthcare related AI uh, startup, uh, there could be different accept acceptability uh, for this application as compared to other countries because uh, recent uh, reports show that um, Finland is among those countries who have the least acceptability for healthcare related AI applications as compared to other countries like India, mm. uh, which has highest level of acceptability for such applications mm. due to uh, many reasons. So you first need to understand uh, how, uh, what type of acceptability your application or startup is going to have in Finland if you think that uh, it is not going to get a good acceptability, then you need to target some other market, some other country. And then there could be issues related to data collection, ethics, privacy, and be uh, aware that uh, there are some new um, AI, ethical AI laws going to be implemented in future, uh, which will categorize uh, the AI applications into different levels based on the risks they can uh, pose. Uh, for those applications which will be rated as having highest risk, they will undergo a strict scrutiny. So they will have to ensure safety and they will have to ensure how uh, they will cope with uh, different challenges related to risks. So if you are going to launch a startup, AI related startup you need to read about those uh, new laws that's very important otherwise uh, you will be in trouble in near future mm -hmm. so th th these are some of the things that uh, the new uh, startup should consider actually i could also add on that i think that's a very important topic to bring up because i come from the startup world so last year i worked uh, for the whole year in the startup uh, in entrepreneurship field and uh, been to many events and many uh, competitions uh, like pitching competitions for instance and that's what i see that really people are so 
eager to jump on the trend and be like, we use AI, and they think that this automatically will get them funding, it will get them all of the opportunities and interest. However, at the moment, it's exactly what Omar said, be really careful about that and uh, don't just try to use AI as a buzzword. Be very cautious. Well, uh, of course, we should uh, go with the trends, otherwise we will soon become outdated. But you need to think how AI works. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, uh, we, we, according to our experience, uh, there are many businesses who want to integrate AI, uh, but they don't know how it actually works. Mm -hmm. So it is important uh, to understand how AI actually works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that topic, I think this goes well into the next question. So how can we equip, like, let's say, a group like immigrants with a combination of entrepreneurship, business, and AI skills? Because it sounds like that's what they need in order to succeed, especially if they want to have a startup which includes AI. Mm -hmm. Anyone can answer, but I think this is this is Umair's question. No? Okay, so, uh, so when it comes to immigrants, we need to equip them with the skills of um, creative thinking, uh, problem solving, um, critical thinking as transversal skills, yeah. apart from entrepreneurship and business skills. And this we can do using AI itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we need to teach them how large language models work, how generative AI works, and how they can uh, employ uh, AI tools um, to turn simple ideas into business ideas. We need to teach them data analysis, content generation using AI itself. This probably requires uh, designing um, tailored curriculums and teaching contents, training workshops. And um, in response to this, we have uh, recently started uh, a project which basically targets immigrants mm -hmm. uh, to teach them entrepreneurship and business skills using AI. So. This is basically uh, focused on uh, developing an AI-driven curriculum and um, uh, developing learning assistants, uh, smart guides, and AI-driven course contents. So the aim is not only to teach immigrants entrepreneurship and business skills, but also to equip them with basic AI skills mm -hmm. so, they can, so that they can compete in the highly competitive uh, market which requires AI skills these mm -hmm. days. Can I just add, Please, because yeah. these are so good what you're mentioning, like I also agree that, you know, entrepreneurs need all sorts of skills, uh, but maybe more on the softer mm -hmm. side or that is not maybe so AI related. What I would be super happy to see uh, from this kind of uh, immigrant perspective is more kind of role models in the field of, you know, entrepreneurship and business. Because I feel that right now in Finland, we have many, many great businesses and many role models who are locals. But we are not really featuring entrepreneurs who are from a different uh, culture or who are from different kind of countries or, you know, who are experts here. So I would be super happy to see in, in just generic, you know, uh, panels and, and in generic uh, kind of speaking engagements to see more more kind of successful immigrant entrepreneurs being featured because that's what we really need and when when i was discussing this topic with my with my colleagues and with our co-founders and of course we all agree that we need all sorts of skills and you know research and and all kinds of uh, this kind of uh, physical things but we also need role models and we need of course networks and and i think those are two things that maybe get a bit uh, behind when we discuss this topic of immigrant entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's interesting. I mean, I think role modeling is really important. Mm. I totally agree. And I know that we do have a lot of projects um, now here at Hagahalia, different research, development, innovation projects. I can't list them all, um, but they do touch on this topic. Um, one of them, I think, specifically is immigrants as business mentors. Mm -hmm. So watch this space. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope uh, to have more to report about that soon. But um, yeah, so hopefully some, some new things happening. Um, there as well. And I think we've talked a little bit now, I think about these like legal implica implications, um, data, privacy, um, this level of like how acceptable is it within certain societies to have these AI enabled applications. But how do you guys think we can ensure that AI could be used as a force for good? 
And again, anyone can answer this rather than it sort of going down this road where you mentioned that maybe it's like not quite secure, or it's not used well, it's not used properly. Do you think legislation is a part of that or, or what do you think? Well, uh, we need to ensure that uh, AI is not fully autonomous because uh, AI is not currently at that level that we can fully rely on it. We cannot even rely on ChatGPT's output. So you need to be critical about uh, whatever you get from ChatGPT. A human in the loop approach is uh, very important, uh, especially for critical applications like uh, healthcare, education, transport, law enforcement. So you cannot uh, fully trust on AI's output. For example, if AI is used to diagnose a disease, there should be a doctor in the loop who could verify AI's output. And uh, AI could be used as an augmentation, not uh, as a doctor, as a replacement of doctor. In a similar way, AI should be human-centered. Like whatever it does, it should be in the benefit of humanity. So it should tailor its output according to human's preference, uh, his needs, requirements. So this, this is what we mean by being human-centered. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there could be issues related to biasedness because AI models are prone to be biased mm -hmm. in many cases. It depends how they, you, you train them. It also depends on the data used for training AI models. If the data is not very well balanced, it will lead to biases in many cases. And the biases can also originate from some unknown sources. You never know. So AI models can mysteriously pick biases from the data itself, mm -hmm. no matter how much you try. So you need to be very careful. And uh, another point is the transparency. You need to understand how AI came to a conclusion, how AI produced an output. The mechanism should be transparent to you. AI should, inter should be able to interpret its decisions. For example, if an AI model predicts a disease, it should be able to tell you how it reached to this conclusion, on what basis it made this conclusion. Or if AI thinks that a particular person is suspect of being a criminal, it should give you the rationale of it. Mm. So this is what we refer to as transparency. You got to get something to say, Evelyn. Yeah, back to this bias thing when you're talking about the bias, that, would you say that is it really like AI the problem or is it actually the humans? Because in, or it, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically isn't AI something that was made by humans? So if AI is biased, it doesn't it mean that actually humans are biased well, and we have like a much larger societal problem there? AI tries to mimic uh, how human brain functions. So, mm -hmm. like we can be biased in many things, so does AI. Okay. So, we can be biased in making uh, certain decisions in our life. And we uh, uh, do it quite often, maybe on daily basis. So, it depends on uh, the input that we receive. It depends on uh, our own ideas and beliefs also. And the same beliefs and ideas can be developed in AI models too. Mm. So it's up to us what data we are using to train AI models. Uh, so uh, we need to be very careful. Uh, so this is what we usually advise to these AI startups. Mm -hmm. When they are going to train AI models, we advise them to be very careful about data collection, uh, data balancing. Uh, so it, it is very important. And to check whether at some point AI model develops some type of bias. Mm -hmm. And if it does, how to cope with this. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit too. I have, I'm going to jump topics, but I think this is super interesting. Actually, I heard about AIs training AIs <laughs> and that they're going to be training each other soon. So they're going to be training on this kind of like, I don't know, it's like metadata at that point. But anyway, um, I think the bias is a really hot topic. And I think the other hot topic is, is AI coming to take all of our jobs? <laughs> Well, I think as Omar mentioned, there always needs to be a person checking everything that AI produces. At the moment, as we probably all know here, that you can't just let it do the job for you. And I think what will be in very high demand um, 
or is already in very high demand is a person that can control the AI and tell them what to do and check the, uh, the outcome. It can be in any industry, in a company of any size, uh, for example, in communications again, like uh, you can ask to uh, AI or let's say the simplest example, you can ask, ask uh, ChatGPT, uh, write a post uh, on, for my company about um, catering. And then you read it and you're like, okay, this is absolutely not what I had in mind. And then you start putting more information and then you start adjusting it. But then what I always recommend is that in this case, even if it kind of looks fine, I think it's very important that you don't lose your tone of voice, no matter whether you create communication for a company or for yourself. So never just, you know, copy whatever AI said and just put it and just post it. I usually am against of this approach, uh, unless you have trained your, uh, your chat so well that uh, you know that it's, uh, you know, <laughs> the good stuff. Uh, but what is important is that you go through what uh, the model has done and you adjust it so that it sounds like a human has written it sounds like you have written it um, and it, it is understandable for your target audience you don't have to you know use all of these smart words or you know keep the tone of voice as it is because I think I as a communications professional can all I can see uh, especially on LinkedIn is a very good example. You go on LinkedIn, you go on a feed, and I can just spot, okay, this was written in AI, uh, uh, like using AI, this has been written using AI. I can see it because it's the same cliched phrases, the same cliched kind of, uh, you know, the structure. So um, until there are, uh, you know, until AI hasn't learned how to cater your needs specifically, how you imagine it in your brain, I think we're pretty safe, especially in the communications. I know maybe some people better differ, but this is my opinion. Yes, yeah, so basically, uh, these large language models, I am repeatedly referring to them over and over because they are the currently, you know, the most important um, AI uh, trend, uh, the, the most trending uh, thing these days. So uh, basically large language models are simple uh, next word generating machines. Uh, more or less this is what human brain also does, but human brain is too complex. It's the product of 4.5 billion years of evolution. So uh, whatever AI generates, uh, like she said, that uh, you can see the same patterns, mm -hmm. okay? And it could be wrong, which we refer to as hallucination. So, uh, but I see it as an added benefit because you can use this uh, limitation to teach critical thinking, to teach information assessment to students. You can teach them how to assess a large language model's output uh, and how to use an iterative method to improve the output. So you'll have to play it around with uh, different settings with different prompts. So it's an iterative approach. You cannot just uh, get uh, um, a desired output in just one go or just with one prompt. In some cases, you need to write a series of prompts. You need to change the prompts. You need to uh, uh, set different tones. So you'll have to try out different settings. Mm -hmm. And also on that note, I wanted to add that I think um, before we used to, for example, we have our CV and in the skills um, section, we usually used to put our hard skills, uh, especially some people just put, put like uh, Microsoft Office <laughs> or I even once saw like uh, internet. <laughs> but uh, so we, we used to put these hard skills, um, maybe more industry specific or less. But I think what we'll see in the future is that people will be more leveraging their soft skills or skills that AI can't do at the moment. So for instance, if you are in communications, um, of course, for, for example, communications and marketing people, I think the expectations also rise up. So you're not only supposed to uh, now create content, like written content, for instance, um, but also video and everything. And people just say, oh, just use ChatGPT and you'll be fine. You know, I see this attitude more and more. But Never mind. So what I wanted to say in, uh, at the at the very beginning is that we'll be putting more of the, our soft skills 
and more of the skills that actually matter, like uh, like you said, critical thinking, um, uh, like spotting different nuances, attention to details. These skills uh, are harder to train. They're not so easy to to track. Okay, I was uh, bad at uh, <laughs> at spotting small things, and now I'm good at it. You know, it's it's difficult, uh, but it is the reality that we need to adjust and. Uh, I think that is also one of the trends we'll see in the future. On that note, I have another question for, for Umer. Um, what do you think our students here, maybe some of the students listening, um, can do to develop their AI skills for a future working life? Uh, yeah, so for... Uh... So first, uh, like I said repeatedly, they need to understand how generative AI works. For example, they need to understand how ChatGPT understands um, human language, how it generates uh, human-like output uh, in the form of text, images, videos, and other modalities. And then you need to think how you can leverage this capability to finding business opportunities. For example, how you can leverage just text summarization uh, capability um, to make money because people are doing this. Um, How you can uh, leverage the capability of image understanding to develop a service or a uh, software solution? You need to think. Mm -hmm. So it's all about. Uh, so it doesn't need. Uh, you don't need to be uh, an AI specialist or data scientist. You just need to have creative thinking skills mm -hmm. so that you can understand how to leverage generative AI. To, in some uh, business ideas to make money. Mm -hmm. and that's interesting. I have a question for, for Evelyn as well. Um, we hear a lot about this kind of entrepreneurial mindset, and I think finding opportunities and learning these new skills is part of it. But, you know, what is entrepreneurial mindset to you, and how would you advise students to develop their entrepreneurial mm -hmm. mindset? Well, to me, entrepreneurial mindset is basically to be open and curious and really like adapt to new things. So not kind of just getting, you know, stuck, but kind of having this open mindset that you're continuously learning and not really kind of closing off yourself from everything that's new just because, you know, maybe you don't like what's new. So I think entre entrepreneurs are really kind of good at that, but also entrepreneurial people in general, I think they have the skill that they, they're just really curious and really open to new things. And then also in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of AI, I noticed there's of course a lot of people who are very critical about it and I think they should be and there should be this kind of critical point of view always when approaching the topic. But then at the same time, I feel that when when we discuss now that how to kind of integrate AI into entrepreneurship and you know how to use it, you don't really have to think of inventing an, uh, a language model or inventing something AI related. You can just think of how to actually make your own job easier with the help of AI. What kind of tools there are already that can help you maybe succeed in your business or succeed in your communications or whatever. So I think you don't really have to think that you have to now invent something like an app or something AI, yeah. but uh, just kind of, you know, use what is already there and, and you know, be open, kind of use it for your own good. That's, uh, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. I agree completely. And Tamara, you've been recently studying and we're going to have some programs as part of the project for Curate, why we're all here today to, to discuss this topic. Can you think of a time when you were studying that you participated maybe in an event or a trip or something like this around entrepreneurship that was really beneficial for you? Yes, uh, I participated in an event called the uh, European Innovation Academy. So that was last year. Uh, I spent a month in Portugal. It was very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved it. Um, and uh, there we had to cre we had to create a business from scratch with people we don't know um, in in three weeks. So that sounds like a very interesting task, but but I was up for a challenge. And uh, we've created actually an app that where uh, that. Uh, 
helps you using AI, by the way, uh, <laughs> helps you choose the right gift for your friends and family. So you would have like a database of your friends and your family members or colleagues or anyone. You would have them there um, as like their profile, so you could friend them. And then based on their um, preferences and their behaviors and their hobbies, uh, the app would suggest you the best gift out of the ones available on um, the connected marketplaces or for example, it could be just an idea. So, so this kind of thinking uh, also, you know, uh, is generated like like you said, uh, Omar, that uh, this kind of you know ideas and creative thinking, thinking outside the box. I think it is uh, studying is the best time to create this because then you'll be too busy, or I don't know, you would have your full time job. <laughs> You would sit at your desk, uh, think about your work, and you wouldn't have the time to really, uh, you know, think, okay, how can I uh, actually uh, improve my soft skills? How can I improve my creative thinking? And in this way, uh, events like European Innovation Academy really help you. And that was a great experience for me as well. And we're now actually getting to the end um, of today's segment, but I think it would be great to have one kind of last response from everybody. So I have a question that's for everyone, and it's very simple. Um, if you could each just give one last piece of advice for the students and people listening. So you can take a minute to think it out, but maybe we could start with Evelyn and go down the line. Mm. <laughs> one sentence or? A short one. A short one. Yeah. Wait, let me put it together. Um, well, maybe just be curious, always. Don't stop being curious. That's my advice. Any advice from you, Amir? Well, um, you uh, asked a question whether uh, AI is going to affect the jobs. Yes and no. AI is go uh, definitely going to affect the jobs. Uh, but at the same time, it's also going to create new opportunities. If you analyze LinkedIn data from 2021, you will see that the AI job uh, postings on LinkedIn have do almost doubled. So it will definitely affect some jobs, but at the same time, it will create new opportunities, uh, new jobs, and it will also result in improved productivity. But only for those who will embrace technology who will keep a pace with technology. Those who don't care about it will be left behind. Mm -hmm. So it's about keeping a pace with the rampant growth of uh, AI. And we have uh, recently witnessed uh, businesses embracing AI. Those who do not uh, use AI at all, they are going to integrate it into their business. And those who have already adopted AI, they are going to advance their solutions. And those who are just sleeping, Mm -hmm. So, uh, in one word, yes, uh, AI will impact job, but at the same time, it will also complement human capabilities, more productivity, new jobs. Don't worry about it. Just learn AI skills. That's it. Mm -hmm. My advice would be don't focus on the things you can't do. Focus on the things that you can do and use the time that you have. Uh, maybe today, after watching this webinar, when you, you know, <laughs> click that button, close, uh, take five minutes and think, how can I use AI to make money, to make myself reach the goal that I want to reach, to make my business uh, more accessible, to, uh, to help me grow in my career? So take the time, do your research and uh, reach out to us if you need any help. Yeah, but thank you so much. This has been like a really interesting discussion for me as well. And I've learned a lot. I can see why, why Umer is so in, in demand here. Um, <laughs> it's been super interesting. And to hear from all of our guests today, I think you guys all had a lot to offer and some really unique perspectives. Um, so today we were joined by Evelyn Bako, Tamara Varenich, and Umer Alihan. 
And I want to thank our listeners also very much uh, for joining us. And again, sorry about the technical difficulties in the beginning. We're also recording this webinar, so you can watch it again on YouTube if you would like. Um, and stay tuned to the USDS website and social media. We're going to have more information, more upcoming discussions from the Curate Project team. We're going to go a little bit more into different sides of innovation, entrepreneurship, and AI. And we have some opportunities uh, for students at the Ulysses European Universities um, to come travel and work, on us, uh, work with us on these topics. So thank you very much for joining us. That's all for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.